1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 29, and it can be found on page 173 in the Pew Bible. Paul's writing to the Corinthians. Abuses at the Lord's Supper. Now in the following instructions, I do not recommend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have been factions among you. So only will it become clear when among you, you are gen genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and the other becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God, and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. The institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you, pro you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes partaking of the Lord's Supper unworthily. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. The word of God for the people of God. I think I've shared before with you that the uh, first wine that I ever tasted in my life was at a communion rail. I was in seminary in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, a part of what we did as seminary students was go to various different churches and participate in a variety of different worship services, sometimes many of them various Christian denominations, but sometimes they were services of other faith as well. And we happened to be on this evening at the Episcopal Church in downtown Kansas City, and uh, they served communion in a particular style that evening where you went forward to the communion rail and you were all given a wafer as the priest or the person who was working with the priest moved down the rail and then you all drank from a common cup. And so the person next to you would drink from the cup, they'd wipe the cup, and then the person next, and then you would drink it, and then it would move on down the line. And so that's how we received communion that evening. And I remember after that service was over, we had a little bit of time as students to gather with the priest of that congregation. And he was talking about serving in that church, and he talked about what a blessing it was because of the tremendous diversity of that congregation and how powerful the sacrament was in that congregation to them. And he shared just recently, he said, I was moving down the communion rail offering the sacrament of communion and I came by an individual who I recognized was a cab driver who had pulled off the route for a few minutes so they could come in and worship this morning with us and that person was at the rail. The person that was kneeling right next to them happened to be the president of one of the largest banks in Kansas City. And the person next to them, 
a college student from a nearby campus. And he thought it was just amazing that you would have probably not seen these people together in fellowship. They wouldn't have shared meals in other places. They probably didn't know each other. They were not friends. And yet, at that rail, at that table, at the Lord's table, they were just all equal. They knelt by each other. They drank from the same cup as it moved its way down the line. And that was the power of the ritual, the power of the sacrament to cut across those economic lines, those influence lines that are cultural for each and every one of us and to set that playing field as a level in that moment. We realize today in the reading of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that it wasn't always like that in the early church. I can't even imagine the frustration of Paul who grew up as a Pharisee and was so trained and educated in the Jewish understandings and the Jewish faith, trying to deal with those congregations in the early church, which were primarily Gentile congregations with very little Jewish influence or participation in them. And you see that in this reading where he begins to write about what the sacrament is in those early churches. It's hard for me to illustrate this, but the best I can do is it's kind of like a tailgate. You know, everybody comes and they bring their own stuff and they all get together in their own group and they just kind of eat and fellowship together as a group. And so the wealthy people who had a lot, they brought a lot, they shared with each other a lot. It was obvious they ate a lot. It was also obvious that they drank a lot. But there were others in that same community of faith who had very little or nothing at all. They came off the street and they had nothing. And while some feasted and got drunk, others stood there without and drank nothing at all because they didn't have anything. But you need to understand as Gentiles, their frame of reference for this was what they did in the temples with the idols before they became a Christian. Corinth was filled with temples of various gods. And they went to those temples and they ate the meals that were there and they had great feasts there. And it was that format that they understood how you gathered together in faith community and celebrated together in a meal. And so they just did what they was used to. They didn't understand the power of the ritual that they were a part of and that was going on in their midst. They didn't understand. They had no history, no frame of reference to understand that when Jesus established an ongoing covenant with his followers through the establishing of what we call communion or the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, that Jesus took what was for the Jewish community probably the most powerful ritual that they knew in their lives and some of the most sacred that they knew, that Jesus embraced the ritual of Passover and he took the Seder meal and using the Seder meal, he set himself up as the Messiah. And that for all generations to come after him, his followers would gather with that understanding. It would take decades, centuries really, before what we know in the church as the sacrament of Holy Communion would really take shape and form. That the power we understand today and later on in our worship as we receive it, the power of this ritual would be formed over decades and decades of understanding, of writing, of practice in the life of the church, of the development of the theology around what we do this morning, as if it's always been this way as if it never was any different. Since I've been here over the last several years, we have practiced the sacrament of communion in a variety of different ways, to the chagrin of many, I will admit. I want you to know something this morning. That whole journey, 
all of the effort that's been a part of it, all of the criticism that I've received because of it has been worth it for me. Because Jesus says it best in Luke 22. When speaking to the disciples, he says, I eagerly desire to eat this meal with you. And that's what it's like for me. I eagerly desire to eat this meal with you because I need to. I need to. And I believe we need to. And I believe we need to as an act of worship in the space in which we worship God and make holy and sanctify by that worship. And that's the reason when I came here, I moved from the practice of us having communion several times on Sunday morning between Sunday school and church and the chapel to bringing it always back into the sanctuary. Because I need to do this. And I need to do it with you. And because I believe there's a power in the ritual that happens when the people of God come together and they receive the bread and they receive the cup, that there are things that happen in our lives through the power of that ritual and it becomes sacred moments to us. When I served on the cabinet a number of years ago, we watched one time in our corporate worship together as superintendents a video of a testimony of a young woman who came to faith in Jesus Christ because of the sacrament of Holy Communion. But she had not been a part of the Christian church or faith. She had not grown up as a Christian. She had not grown up as a part of the life of the church. But as she began to experience Christian community and began to understand the sacrament of Holy Communion, she said, I just desired so much to be a part of that community of faith. I just desired so much to be in relationship with that one who had died for me. And I wanted to join together with them and be one of those followers who ate that bread and drank that cup together. And for that reason, I gave my heart and my life to Christ. There's a power in the ritual that shapes and forms our lives. It is a means of grace a means by which you and I come to experience and know God in greater and greater ways. As we prepare for the sacrament this morning, I invite you to open your hearts and lives to receive what Christ has for you this morning as we prepare for the sacrament of Holy Communion. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, Move us, Lord, to open our hearts and our lives to you. That this cup, this bread, makes us one with you. That we might celebrate your life with us, in us, and through us. In your name we pray. Amen. to get home, Lord, I'm bearing 
the heavy burdens trying to get home. Lord, I'm bearing heavy burdens. Lord, I'm bearing heavy burdens. Lord, I'm bearing heavy burdens trying to get home. trying to get home. Lord, I'm climbing high mountains to trying to get home. Lord, I'm climbing high mountains. Lord, I'm climbing high mountains. Lord, I'm climbing trying to get home. Lord, I'm standing a hard trial. Oh.